All right, we would like to welcome you to the future of commerce on Drupal 8. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Is anybody here building e-commerce projects right now? A few of us? Okay. Oh, just cool. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about, and, and most of us are still using Ubercart for a lot of that stuff. So, yeah, some of us are, yeah. Um, do I, I don't think we support any Ubercart sites anymore, do we? No. No, there was only, I, I found one in Greenville, South Carolina, selling used upscale baby goods through an Ubercart marketplace. That was interesting. Um, but we are here to talk about Drupal Commerce. <coughs> Once upon a time, we were both Ubercart maintainer contributors, um, but have, of course, moved on. Um, and we'll tell that story. In brief, um, as for introductions, I'm Ryan Zarama. This is Boyan Zavanovich. And um, we like to stand on platforms and piers in San Francisco looking fabulous for the camera. <laughs> um, and we are both um, co-workers at Commerce Guys, um, which is a uh, Drupal shop based in Paris um, with an office in London in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and a handful of people here and there, such as in Panchevo, Serbia, and Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and um, we, we primarily operate in uh, R&D capacity with Boyan leading Drupal Commerce 2.x development, um, me still maintaining Commerce 1.x, and then also rescuing projects that need to be rescued amongst our U.S. team, myself. And providing random wisdom on hip chat. Yes, random wisdom on hip chat and occasionally showing up in IRC and ignoring everybody. <laughs> um, but we are the company also behind um, Platform.sh, um, which is a Drupal platform as a service that we use to build and launch our e-commerce projects and our non-e-commerce projects and our non-Drupal projects, such as custom symphony applications and other things. <laughs> um, but, of course, our, our first love and our primary focus for Boyan and myself is Drupal Commerce, um, which is an e-commerce framework built on Drupal 7. Um, that was sort of created with the vision to um, become the number one open source e-commerce framework in the world. And we really wanted to power truly flexible e-commerce. Um, so this is the point in the presentation where Boyan will show us on the table if you could bend yourself backwards or do the pretzel thing. Maybe some other time. Okay. Not, still working on that flexibility. Yeah. Um, He's a bit embarrassed. Um, let's talk about Drupal Commerce as it is today, and then we will talk about the future of Drupal Commerce. Uh, and just to clarify, the future of Drupal Commerce is on Drupal 8, not on Drupal 7. Um, so Commerce 2.x, whenever you see that, is the Drupal 8 version of Drupal Commerce. And you may have heard that it doesn't strictly involve Drupal and Drupal modules, um, but that's still its primary focus, and we'll clarify what all that means during the course of this presentation. Um, so, so Drupal Commerce today um, is a core uh, set of modules in one project called Drupal Commerce or at drupal.org slash project slash commerce. And these modules um, were built from scratch on Drupal 7 to make use of the fieldable entity system that was brand new in Drupal 7. In fact, um, when we started developing Drupal Commerce, uh, it wasn't finished. And I, actually, it's still not really finished on Drupal 7. Well, it's much better than before. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we, uh, we got to be the guinea pigs to see what it would look like to build a complex set of modules or like a complex application on this, this new fieldable entity system that previously was just limited to nodes or just, just the, the domain of nodes. The fact that you could take any type of content type on your Drupal 6 site, add fields to it, mix and match things. Um, that was brand new in Drupal 7 to be applied to any type of data, including in Drupal Commerce your um, products, line items, orders, customer profiles, and payment transactions. So we built this from scratch on Drupal 7, and we, we stuck with just those five new entity types, and I think uh, three or four field types, price field, line item reference field, customer profile reference, and a product reference field. And we said that these were enough pieces um, to build any kind of e-commerce application you would need to build, which was a bit uh, optimistic. Um, but we kept the core minimalistic and flexible so that we could um, you know, put out point releases whenever we wanted to instead of having to wait for 30 different modules to be updated and bug-free uh, before putting out a new minor release. Um, and so we were able to keep it uh, 
keep our code footprint a little bit smaller than we were with Ubercart um, because we were able to depend on views for all of our listings on the front end and the back end. And was it, did you work on views form stuff, or was it yeah. Andre yeah. as well? And yeah. yeah. So, so what we did was make it possible for views to be used as forms, and then we made our shopping cart a view as well. So each of our listings from our shopping carts to our admin interfaces uses the exact same method of building and theme. Yeah, and, and this uh, functionality made its way into the core views project, um, and of course now it's part of Drupal 8. Um, which is fun to see your code sort of swim up the stream there. And the same happened for other things, um, such as the entity reference field that came out of some commerce projects we did, and a few other bits and pieces. Um, we also made the decision not to hard code business logic, um, such that uh, you know we made assumptions for you about the kind of product you were selling, um, or the, the kind of uh, payment model you had, or how you expected the checkout form to work. And, and we were able to achieve flexibility by standardizing on the rules module, which I'm sure is familiar to most of us, um, so that instead of shipping with hard-coded bits of logic that you had to override in code somehow, you can just disable or enable a different rule or change the conditions and actions that, um, that, that are triggered when. Um, so you know, a classic example is what happens on checkout completion. Should a user account be created or not? And if it's created, should the user be emailed? All that stuff was made part of rules so that you literally can um, have a truly anonymous checkout experience in Drupal Commerce or one that requires a customer to register before even getting to the checkout form. And all of that's managed through rules primarily and then a few contributor modules um, that are extending the feature set. Um, so we have what we sort of identified as essential contributed modules. And these are things like the shipping module, the address book module, um, discounts and coupons um, that we all sort of, we, we looked for ways to incorporate their development into client projects um, so we could then develop the solutions generically, release them, and then let other people build into them and exp you know, expand upon them. And of course, you know, a, a classic example is we created the shipping framework and our need for, for my, actually it was my need, I think I did it for my cheese website. I sell cheese online. And I wanted flat rate shipping, um, but other people needed UPS integration, FedEx integration, DHL, whatever. And so all that stuff just happened on top of these essential contributor modules. Um, and then we also, um, we, we decided that we really needed a distribution approach to, to complete the user experience. Um, otherwise, like people just get all of these modules and don't really know what to do with them, don't know what they can do with them. And if you've ever tried to put a salesperson in front of a customer and just give them a blank installation of Drupal to try and sell the idea that we can build them a, a robust you know, website or e-commerce application, you can understand why we might have had to bring a little bit more to the table. Um, but at the core, you know, it, it was lean and mean and ultimately ended up doing something right because we're now up to about 57,000 um, sites reporting into Drupal.org um, as using Drupal Commerce to power their e-commerce. Which is the current record for e-commerce on Drupal in general? Woohoo! Yeah, finally, I finally beat my previous speed run, um, and uh, overtook Ubercart sometime a year ago or something. I don't know. Um, and so, when when we looked to improve the user experience, like I said, the first thing we looked to do was um, sort of imagine what would Drupal Commerce look like um, as an out-of-the-box application. So, in other words, picture Magento or Shopify or some other off-the-shelf e-commerce solution. And that's what people expected when they came to evaluate Drupal for its e-commerce capabilities. And if they didn't see something that looked like a store, they kind of walked because they just assumed that there was no serious e-commerce functionality. Kind of like uh, Virtue Mart or WordPress Shop. Not serious e-commerce functionality. Uh, and yet, it, you know, it looks pretty, pretty light and, and not, uh, you know, not polished or complete. So Commerce Kickstart um, was our solution. Um, to create a distribution of Drupal that function as a good marketing tool, um, a good recipe book, uh, and also like a, a decent enough foundation for launching a new e-commerce project. Um, and, and it turned out to do all of those things very well. Um, so Boyan, you were intimately involved in the development of Commerce.x, so I'll let you, um, you know, run through the slides of, of the, the main areas of functionality it offers. Yeah, sure. So our main goal for Kickstart was actually fixing the admin UI. Commerce at the time had the reputation of being a bit difficult to use uh, on the merchant side, so we hired designers and recreated our admin screens to create something that's optimized for the Kickstart use case, which is an e-commerce site that does shippable products. 
so we created completely new product and order listings with capabilities such as exchanging messages with the customers, uh, the ability to view an order at a glance, uh, and especially the creation of inline entity form which allowed you to create a product and all of its variations on the same screen. Previously, that was a process that took multiple steps and we managed to design and implement a solution that allowed you to do the same on just one screen. And since then, inline entity form has become one of the most popular Drupal modules and it's seeing even more usage in Drupal 8. For example, Yanis is using it for media in Drupal 8, so that's cool. That Yanis is so hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> we built a responsive front-end theme, the kind that was cool in 2012, Omega 3 base, <laughs> <laughs> simply to, to, to show how such a thing should look. It looks good on a mobile phone. It, it looks good regardless of the resolution. No, nothing really special there from, from today's perspective, but it looked good, and it still does. We built all of the product marketing tools that a user evaluating commerce expected to see at the time, so being able to see color switches and better image zoom, slideshows, blogs, all of the usual tools that people use for marketing products and presenting them uh, in a user-friendly way. And, of course, we created our crown jewel, which is the, the faceted search, which automatically adapts to your product model. So we use the search API module, which I consider simply one of the best modules that Drupal has to offer, uh, to create this automatic faceted search. No matter what product types you have, we automatically create facets for you al and allow users to search through the product collection, to browse through it, and it, it works just as you would expect it to work on a really big e-commerce site. And of course, since it's Search API, you can have multiple backends and use Apache Solar or even your database if you're on weaker hosting and have less visitors. And to, uh, to finance all of that, we decided to connect ourselves with the leading payment gateways and third-party tools, help them create modules for Drupal Commerce, and then ship the most popular ones inside Kickstart. So the moment you install Kickstart, you can simply enable PayPal or Authorize.net and start selling. And that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, footnote, I guess, in, in terms of general Drupal development, um, is that this is a distribution that actually finances itself now. Um, with the you know the revenues coming from these partnerships more than paying for uh, the costs of the company to invest in the future of Drupal Commerce, so it kind of makes this self-sustaining ecosystem. So Kickstart was and still is the most popular Drupal distribution. Uh, it has thirty thousand installs, which, when you think about it, is a small percentage of total Drupal installations, but it's still an impressive number. Yeah, and so all, all of this um, this practice of uh, improving the user experience. So you wanna Rotate again. I don't know That's that awkward. Works. All right. <laughs> um, what, what all this uh, showed us was the things that we left out of Drupal Commerce Core um, that people really resonated with in Commerce Kickstart and in Contrib, and, and really didn't want to have to reinvent and reapply on every you know site they built. They kind of were able to take that information um, to then plan for a stronger Drupal Commerce 2.x, um, and also you know once again we, we decided to kind of get out in front of a trend. Um, in core and contrib Drupal, um, whereas on Drupal 7, we kind of got in front of the trend of adopting fieldable entities as the, the root of your architecture for your custom project. This time around, we're, we're looking at ways to incorporate third-party PHP libraries into our modules since Drupal 8 itself is now standardizing on Symfony and using Composer to build up this library of, uh, library of libraries that Drupal then is powered by. Um, and so here we'll talk a bit about um, what planning Drupal Commerce 2.x has looked like, and then also what's been developed so far. Um, so we, we started with a sprint in Paris, um, I guess last July, yeah. um, and we brought together um, a handful of folks from different European agencies and e-commerce projects, and also um, Fabien Potencier from Sincio Labs, and others who, um, you one, have e-commerce experience, two, had direct Drupal Commerce experience, like the guys from ICOS, um, who built Lush, um, along with us, and then um, other just you know independent contributors in the Drupal community who uh, understand how to you know work with Drupal 8. So basically, augment some of my weakness um, as Drupal 8 was still new to me and still is. Obviously, Boyan has a lot more experience in it now. Um, but what we decided was 
we were going to adopt an architectural model um, where we created first standalone libraries, and these standalone libraries encapsulate um, sort of immutable logic, um, things that don't change from e-commerce project to e-commerce project. Um, they aren't unique to Drupal Commerce or Ubercart or Magento or Shopify or anybody. So these are things that will cover like currencies and address related things. Um, and then we had to then take these libraries and somehow put them into Drupal in some sort of an entity relationship model that made sense for e-commerce that was a bit more robust than what we have in Commerce 1.x. So instead of just the five core entity types, we'll now have many more. And part of that is due to the fact that Drupal 8 has two different sort of super classes of entities, some that store the configuration of your website and then some that store the actual content that you create. Um, and so we, we have to define all of this stuff, and it was, it's very class-heavy um, from a module development standpoint. Um, but that's now a work in progress. And then the final thing is the whole like user interaction layer. Um, so what will a product page look like, the shopping cart form, the checkout form? All of that stuff is yet to be developed, actually. That's nice. Um, so once again, we're starting from scratch. Has anybody here actually written a Drupal 8 module? A few folks, yeah? We, uh, Quite a few. Yeah, actually more than I expected. <laughs> That's more than me. Um, and I, I, I assume that most people are, uh, you know, well, shoot, we can't really pass the mic around. But basically, you're either going to take a Drupal 7 module and try to forward port it um, or just rewrite it from scratch. And, and honestly, with something as, as large and complex and, and all-encompassing as Drupal Commerce, we opted just to start from scratch and not try to forward port and then retrofit the changes because there's just too much different. Um, yeah, yeah and, and simply Drupal Commerce owes its success to the fact that it was a native Drupal 7 application. So if we wanted to repeat that success, we needed to rethink our approach and rebuild from scratch on Drupal 8 using all of these great new technologies and to once again appear native to a new generation of developers. Yeah. And so, so to visualize like how the core framework itself will change, and then we'll come back to what the libraries are all about. Um, like I said, we have you know five entity types, four field types in Drupal Commerce One, and then a whole bunch of other entity types and field types and um, forms and, and additional user interfaces defined in Contrib. In Commerce 2.x, you know we're looking at at least like nine or ten or so different um, entity types, and this is a bit outdated, so um, I need to update this slide. Um, but but the basic idea is that. Um, you know, we, we need to actually be able to do things like organize all of the products and orders and line items on your website by um, what store they were purchased through. That's not just to, um, to support multi-seller stores or, or multi-vendor stores, but even just a, a single vendor um, website um, currently doesn't really have a great way to store this sort of like global configuration around um, you know, what, what currencies you're using or default languages or default whatever. Is, you know, it, it, it's all just kind of configuration in different parts of Drupal. And here we're saying we want to have a store entity that can kind of contain a lot of that configuration, uh, but then also do things like um, support that Etsy-style marketplace or something. Um, so that's one example of, of what we expect to change. Um, but, but really, I, it's, it's, we aren't closed yet on how many entity types we'll have. Um, so feel free to propose your favorite one and let us shoot it down. Um, but we have a, we have a, a pretty good idea um, that we're going to need things like the store entity type, which is already defined, um, payment allocations that assign parts of a payment transaction to specific line items on an order, that sort of thing, to, to address some of the deficiencies in our 1.x data model. Um, and so one of, one of the major changes that we'll have, and, and this is still a work in progress, um, is that um, in Drupal Commerce 1.x, I think uh, we'll mostly be familiar with the fact that you define all of your product SKUs, and then you use typically a node with a product reference field to group these things together. And so you, you have a bunch of sibling product entities that are grouped together for the, per, you know, for the, uh, the point of display for, for the sake of purchasing it. And the add to cart form is really this, this controller that determines, okay, given all of these different products and the fields they have in common and which ones you've referenced, I can then create these select lists that let you select a size and a color and a day of the week or whatever it is, you know, what we call product attributes. 
And so all of that is really derived from the configuration of these products in a group, whereas in Commerce 2.x, we want to be a bit more intelligent and say that uh, it, it's actually possible to construct a, a more um, hierarchical data model that doesn't require you to define individually all of the different variations, um, but, but could, uh, could scaffold a lot of that out for you by at a product type level, letting you specify the hierarchy and then create them all at once, which in Commerce 1.x is similar to the way that the bulk product creation module works, um, but still, like, we think a bit more intelligent. Um, and additionally, what we want to do is get away from the requirement that you're using nodes to display products to the end user. Um, so uh, products at any level of the hierarchy could have uh, a public-facing URL, and then you know from the top of the pyramid down, whatever products are in this group for the URL you're looking at would become part of the add to cart form. Um, so, so theoretically, this is what we're, we're, we're researching right now. Theoretically, I could have just one page that was the whole T-shirt style A, where I would then select a color and then select a size from the available options. Um, or I could also choose to have separate pages for the red shirt and the blue shirt. And then have the add to cart form sort of build itself around whatever products fall underneath that in the tree. Um, so that, that's a work in progress. Um, so is um, considering how to, to improve the checkout user experience and support multiple checkout workflows and optional checkout panes and all of that. Um, I had this bright idea that may not be so bright um, that we might be able to take advantage of form modes in Drupal 8. Um, so much like in Drupal 7, you have different view modes um, where I can say that a product looks different in a teaser versus the full page versus the search listing in the RSS feed. Um, in this case, maybe I could say the checkout form has you know, different um, field sets or widgets you know, for different types of um, products that are being sold or something like that. Um, the, the thought was we could take advantage of this core mechanism to support multiple checkout workflows for sites, for example, that, that accept donations but also sell physical products, but they want a direct donation form that doesn't involve multiple steps or confirmations. Um, but then for somebody buying a physical product, they still have to go through you know, entering their shipping information and selecting a shipping service and all that. Um, but even if, even if we aren't able to take advantage of um, the form mode concept in Drupal 8, um, we do have ideas for how to improve this over the implementation on Drupal Commerce 1, um, where you, uh, it was an improvement over Ubercard in the sense that we could now alter the checkout form and, and even alter the way that it appeared by adding fields to customer profiles and so on. Um, it still has drawbacks in the way that we validated and submitted the entire checkout form um, you know, in the, the actual form validate handler. And it was, it's, a bit, it's a bit tricky. Anyways. So, so if there's one outtake from this, it's that we are no longer making the checkout UX optional. We want to offer a good UX out of the box, even, of course, still allowing you to change it, and at the same time allowing you to implement completely different checkout flows. So if you want to swap out the checkout form and implement something that's completely custom, we want to offer you better tools to do that, even being able to select those at random them for A, B testing or whatever else crosses your mind. Um, additionally, similar to improving checkout workflows, we wanted to improve our core support for the order workflow. Um, so if, you, if you've built a complex Drupal Commerce site that involved lots of like automated steps in order fulfillment um, or, or refunds or whatever it is you know, that you've had to, to automate um, state transitions or, uh, you know, Inter interfaces with third-party APIs or whatever, you've probably hit some limitations um, with, the, with the, I guess, with the fact that um, the order status is literally just like a text field that you're, you're able to move into and out of any, any status at all um, from any other status. There's, there's no hardened um, workflow requirements. There's no prerequisites for entering or leaving certain statuses. All this stuff makes it a bit, a bit difficult to um, manage what actually happens to orders on the site. And, you know, a lot of people get bit by the fact that um, I think right now if you go to PayPal and um, you submit a payment uh, using PayPal Payment Standard on their website, um, the payment notification will get back to the Drupal Commerce site before the customer returns to the site. Uh, but a lot of folks take advantage of that payment notification to do um, like a state transition and move the order into a new status. Uh, that actually prevents the customer from successfully returning from PayPal back to their checkout URL. 
Um, and, and it's just, you know, kind of a thing you just have to know about and manage is that, like, just because you can monkey with the status anytime you want to, um, it actually can break the user experience. Uh, and it also can make it difficult to have, like, one status transition automatically triggering the next um, because you hit limitations in, like, the entity cache and other things that just kind of make it pretty difficult to manage. Um, so does anybody use JIRA for project management? Yeah, yeah. Wow, well, that's great. I, re I really like JIRA. Um, we kind of just adopted it last year. And, and I really like it for the fact that I can create any number of, you know, types of issues per project that I'm managing. And then I can create any number of types of workflows that these issues must progress through um, to be considered complete uh, or delivered to the customer. Um, and then I can basically apply prerequisites and, and even, um, you know, things like forms that you have to submit whenever you're doing the state transition. And so, so we're looking right now, and, and I, maybe you'll have to speak to this. We, we were looking at using the, the workflow module, um, a, a generic. Won't. What's that? Which we won't. We won't. Okay. Yeah. So we were looking at using an existing solution um, to, uh, I, I think it was maybe built around like managing node, you know, editing workflows, like a generic solution for just any kind of entity type. Um, but, but ultimately, we, we want to be able to say that an order can move from this status to this status only if these conditions are met and um, you know, begin to just manage this a bit more aggressively so that orders aren't just going all over the place and yeah, getting lost. And, yeah. um, and you know, what, what, what's, what's the, the current thinking on um, you know, how we're going to manage workflows in 2.x? Well, the current thinking is that we're basically going to put the state field module in core. So the order will have multiple workflows, one that represents the payment workflow, one that represents the checkout workflow, and one that represents the main order workflow. These states can be configured on the actual state field attached to the entity. And then we fire events, which are the Drupal 8 version of hooks, to ask the rest of the system, am I allowed to make the, this transition yet or not? Am I able to enter checkout if I have less than $100 of products? Am I able to go into fulfillment before I've collected payment? Is fulfillment done before I've actually sent the packages? Decisions like that. And, and it also is worth noting that we're not going to require rules you know, for managing this. In fact, most of this would be probably hard-coded and managed in your repository. I guess through YAML configuration files that uh, like use configuration entities that are then well, most of it will still be in events, and rules will respond to these events. So it means you don't need to use rules, you don't need to even install rules, but if you're using rules, the previous level of functionality is still available. So it's your choice, but we give a bit more power to developers. Yeah, and that, that's a bit of a defense mechanism, just as far as like having an independent release schedule, um, whereas in Drupal 7, um, you know, Drupal Commerce was being developed before views and rules and the Entity API, and Drupal itself had stable releases. Um, this time around, we decided to be slightly less, you know, uh, masochistic and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, ma not make these things optional. Yeah, not yeah. depend on rules which doesn't exist. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, Though they've made good progress recently. Yeah. And in, in Drupal Commerce 1.x, the only hard requirement that we had for rules um, was for product price calculation. Um, and, and honestly, it was, it was for, it was, it was over-engineered. Um, the idea was we, if, if we forced all of the product pricing to happen through rules, uh, we could then actually um, determine how many variations any particular product might have in terms of prices and then pre-calculate these prices and store them in the database so that you could actually sort and filter product catalogs based on these calculated prices depending on what conditions are met and blah, blah, blah. Nobody ever used it. So we forced a requirement on rules for a feature that never actually got used in production. So we're trying to avoid that mistake this time around. Um, we also know that um, you know, the, the fact that the rules user interface is the only user interface that we, that we offer in core for managing discounts and coupons and taxes and all that stuff was, was really a, a limiting factor for Drupal Commerce 1. Um, so we, we did build the discounts module um, as part of the Commerce Kickstart initiative. Um, it the discount <laughs> module has <laughs> issues with handling uh, discounts applies to prices with taxes included, which is a European use case that no e-commerce solution does well. So we inherited some of those problems and we are finally solving them for 2.x. And there are a few performance issues that we are still working through. Yeah. And, and even just like user interface issues that I think we'll, we'll be addressing in 2.x. But the, the, the basic idea is that um, you know, if you picture like a simplified user interface built on top of rules, that, that was the goal. 
um, the idea that uh, the, the sort of underlying configuration is still transparent, not baked into sort of like, uh, you know, opaque entities like we use a discount entity for discount, uh, the, the current discounts module. But, but make that a bit more transparent um, and, you know, give a simplified user interface that a merchant could understand to set up all of their different specials and, you know, seasonal prices and all that stuff. Um, so that's, I think, probably the most uh, undefined part of the current Commerce 2.x, like well, we user interface. We actually have like a good that. idea on what we want to do. We are just not sure how it should look like. So I'm hoping that some great UX people will help me on that. Uh, yeah. Um, I already mentioned, you know, the fact that we're having a store entity that lets us support multi-store, multi-vendor sites. And it's not a huge use case, but it's, it's good to know that we can do it. Um, but, but really where the most exciting part of Commerce 2.x development comes in, in my opinion, is, is what we're doing with our PHP libraries. Um, so I mentioned we have three main areas of functionality. It's the standalone libraries. It's the, the sort of entity relationship model and then the whole user interface layer. Um, right now, our PHP libraries are the furthest along. Right? They're at a beta phase. They're being used by other projects. They're being used in production. Um, and they're even being used to influence the development of Symfony itself. And we'll talk about you know, how each one has sort of played out. Um, but then the, you know, we're, we're currently in the process of defining all of our entity types and our field types. And then the last thing to really be worked on is the user interface layer. So there is no like add to cart form or checkout form right now. Um, but the PHP libraries um, were started with research, um, which is what, what are the things that, um, that we did uh, poorly in Commerce 1.x, and not necessarily poorly because we were stupid or made bad decisions, um, but because we didn't necessarily understand the problem space and the full like complexity that we needed to manage. Um, we looked into existing solutions for things like managing currencies in an abstract fashion or managing um, prices and discounts in an abstract fashion. We looked even into other e-commerce bundles on Symfony. Um, we looked into non-PHP e-commerce projects to see if there were any solutions there. And um, ultimately, um, you know, Boyan leading much of this research led us to, to, to the conclusion that we needed to introduce our own libraries to address um, a handful of, of use cases that, uh, that we were not doing well. So the age-old um, weaknesses in our, in our tax management and calculation. Um, the fact that in Drupal Commerce 1.x you don't have a price API. So if you're, if you're manipulating prices in Commerce 1.x right now, you're still responsible for updating a data array. And just you have, you have to know this, that, that even though the price field has an amount column, you still have to manipulate this, this random PHP array uh, so, that, so that it adds up to the total of the amount column. Otherwise, whenever you do uh, an order total calculation, the, the order total is different from what you expected it to be. So, so we had an incomplete like price management API. Um, of course, with each new release of Drupal Commerce, um, we added more currency support because our, our approach to that was just wait until somebody said, hey, you don't support my currency, whatever it is. And then we'd roll a new release to include their specific formatting. Um, but then even then, we, we never really supported like the same currency being formatted in differently in different countries or locales. I mean, so really, we, we wanted to identify and address these weaknesses with a handful of PHP libraries. And, and right now, I believe it's, well, actually, we've added a sixth. I don't have enum up here. Um, but we, we've created five standalone solutions, one for internationalization. Um, especially dealing with um, locale-specific currency formatting. Uh, another for address format management, um, which is um, not just how should this be, uh, how should the form for entering an address be formatted and presented to the user, um, but also how should the address data be validated, um, and how should it be printed out in different languages. Um, all that kind of stuff needed to be managed in a standalone library. And these things are, are easy to abstract because they, they literally don't change. I mean, there are standards. There are international standards for these things. Um, so we also propose libraries for um, grouping territories together for the sake of simplifying some tax calculation and shipping calculation. And then also uh, helping developers work better with the tax API and price API in general. Um, so I'll let Boyan kind of run us through um, the, de the development of these. And I, I guess it's important to point out that um, what, we were, what we were reaching for was not just a, um, a yet another set of abstract like interfaces, because I think there are a few projects that, that really just kind of define a set of interfaces that you're then still left to fully implement. Um, but we also wanted to provide actual, um, you know, actual classes and then actual data, so not forcing everyone to find and supply their own address data or um, currency data. Um, we wanted to have minimal dependencies, create simple APIs with clear documentation, and of course, um, create libraries that had the ability even to
to, to be fully covered by automated tests. And so that led us to the creation of a handful of libraries that Boyan will run us through. Um, yeah. So as Ryan said, one of the initial problems that we had is that our currency list that we shipped with commerce was never truly up to date. We had currencies missing, and even if we, cre we added them, they would quickly become out of date. Why? Because inflation happens, killing your minor units, or simply some currencies stop being used and new gets added. So we needed a source of currency information that was always up to date so that we could regenerate the list from time to time. And we actually find, found that in the CLDR project, which has completely open locale data in uh, JSON format, released twice a year and maintained by big companies such as Apple and Microsoft and others. For example, Drupal Core is using CLDR for the country list instead of using the official ISO one, which has weird country names. Mm -hmm. So by using the CLDR data, we got a currency list that was always up to date and that had translated names and symbols for all languages. So you no longer need to translate the currency list, you get all of the translations out of the box. And if you ever used booking.com, you know that they offer that huge currency list with symbols and names in the currently selected language, where, well, we now offer that out of the box. We also implemented a really advanced formatter that formats prices according to the current locale. So that means that the fact that the euro price looks differently in France and Germany is no longer a problem because we take into account the rules for the given locale. And we, by implementing that in the library, we managed to skip depending on the INTL PHP extension, which actually, which is usually used for that, but isn't present by default on many servers. So the Symphony team liked that, and they actually started following our lead, doing the same thing. They committed the CLDR data set into their own Symphony INTL library. So if you're using Symphony today, you actually get the same currency in country lists uh, that we championed and pioneered, and we are actually working with them to merge the number formatter as well and merge the rest of this library. So on our first try, we managed to significantly influence Symfony as well as uh, fix something that was a long time problem for us. Yeah, all of the nice things I mentioned. <laughs> so you can see an example here of a euro amount that looks differently in Great Britain, in France, and in Germany, or an example of a price uh, for an Arabic market, uh, which uses different numbers, of course. So that was one of the use cases that we also needed to support. Sorry, I was going to try to actually open up the speaker notes so you can see what's no. coming up. I'm good, thanks. All right, so yeah, because Command S is not the right. Uh, hey, there we go. All right, so go ahead. Pretend that didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> So the next major one we created was addressing. You might have used address field in, in Drupal 7. Uh, the problem that address field has was that every single country has different rules for postal addressing. Countries mandate which fields should be present on the address form, in which order, how they should be labeled, and how they should be validated. So address field tried to implement a bunch of form alters that added country-specific rules, like here's what UK does and here's what France does. But of course, that wasn't sustainable. So this and time no two developers ever agree. <laughs> yeah. So this time around, we actually developed this concept of an address format, which holds all of those country-specific requirements. And then we use the address format to actually render an address for display, or validate it, or create and present an address form. And we ad took all of this logic and put it inside the addressing library. Of course, all of this is not as useful if you don't have the actual address format information. So for a while, it looked like we would need to do that on our own. But then we found out that Google created such a data set for Android. So they gathered the address formats for 200 countries, as well as the lists of admi administrative divisions and their translations for over 40 countries. Mm -hmm. And then when we mailed them, they allowed us to take their data set and release it under the MIT license in our library. And by doing that, we created a library that was never before seen in the PHP world, which made us a uh, trending developer on GitHub for a while and is now being uh, actually adopted by Cilius, the Symfony 2 e-commerce solution, along with our zone and text libraries. We still need to give them a little bit of help on that, but I'm optimistic that the full integration will happen soon. And of course, yeah. 
and then we take this library and we depend on it from our new address module which is how we're calling the successor to, ad to address field and we, we pull in the library using composer yeah, little nice slides. <laughs> uh, yeah, w one one awesome example for the strength of the address data that we've got is that we never would have known that if you're formatting an address form for uh, a Chinese customer, um, that you actually have to reverse the field order if the form is being presented in English versus in Chinese. Um, yeah. And so, like all all of that detail has already been discovered yeah. and gathered, and I think we've actually been able to submit several pool requests to yeah. the actual core data set. Yeah, we fixing su problems. We submitted over <laughs> 15 clarifications to Google that are now going to land in the next Android release Woo. or something. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. And we actually managed to take large parts of that data set and backport that into Address Field for Drupal 7. So if you're using Address Field 1.1, it has at least 30 to 40 percent of these improvements directly there. And by doing so, we actually closed. More more than a yeah. hundred issues <laughs> in the address field issue queue, which shows that a good approach can take you a long way. Yeah. So and and this is this is part of what I mentioned earlier. How with Drupal Commerce now we're able to get out a, out in in front of like a new trend in contributor module development. It was the whole idea that we could get off the Drupal island, and and oftentimes that that idea was we could get off the island by using other libraries in our project. But now we're also saying we, c we, have, we have something valuable to export to other communities and other applications. Yeah. Um, and that also you know, ha has led um, Boyan and others to contribute significantly to the way that uh, Drupal Core and then Contrib works with Composer to be able to pull in these libraries and data sets. And so it, it has a broad influence, I think. Yeah. And, and for those who don't know, Composer is the drush of the PHP world and actually one that will partially be replacing our own drush to be used for installing modules and installing libraries and keeping your site up to date. So basically as a replacement for drush DL and drush make. So back to the libraries. The next one we created is called Commerce Guys Zone. So we are introducing the concept of a zone into Drupal Commerce, which is a geographical grouping. So a list of countries or a list of states with included or excluded postal codes that you can use for shipping or tax purposes. Let's see if we have an example here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's as that's far as it goes. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, you can that's say that intense. you have one set of shipping rates for California and Nevada and one set of shipping rates for the European Union. Or you can say these tax rates are used for this zip code or these tax rates are used for this country and these zip codes. Because, for example, in Europe, uh, there are some edge cases that say, for example, that German VAT is used in Germany and parts of Austria. So to be able to actually encapsulate those edge cases, we created this entity called zone that has a list of states and zip codes and everything and it can be used to significantly simplify your events and your rules that you're writing. And then there's our crown jewel which is the tax library. <laughs> so in the past three and a half years the way the world does taxes changed dramatically. Previously you would in install an e-commerce solution, you would look up your tax rate on Wikipedia, you would input that and you would be ready to go. But since January 1st, 2015, uh, Europe requires you to apply the customer's tax rates if you're selling them digital products, so ebooks or videos or trainings or access to a site, which means if you have a German customer, you're charging German VAT. If you have a Spanish customer, you're charging Spanish VAT. And of course, Europe is a big market, but this is not limited to Europe because there is a very clear trend of countries trying to impose their own tax rates for the, the for purchase of digital products. So this meant that we needed to create first a data set of known tax rates so that when you installed commerce and selected your country, we knew which tax rates are used in your country and we would import them. And of course, in Europe, importing all of the tax rates for Europe so we would know which ones to select. It would be bad if I told you that you needed to look up the tax rates of 28 countries in Europe and then input that manually. And Additionally, you have you know, the ability to track when tax rates change. Yeah. So that I if you're having to recalculate a historical tax, um, and, and this is you know, maybe less applicable to the United States where there are just thousands and thousands of tax rates, but at, at least internationally, you know, being able to, to recalculate what the tax was on an order three months ago versus today is very important. Yeah. Generally, 
uh, it's not uncommon for a tax rate to change at least once a year, especially in Europe. So if it changes on January 1st, you really don't want to spend your New Year's Eve waiting with your finger on the submit button so you can change the tax rate on your site so that new orders, in case someone decides to order on January 1st or 2nd, have the correct tax rate applied. Instead, our tax rates now have a start and an end date, which means that they will automatically switch to the next one, and if you're doing historic calculations, they still know which percent to apply. And our tax types actually now reference the zones that I mentioned so that uh, we, can more, we can better select the appropriate tax rates. Because as you know, in the U.S., the tax rates are per zip code, so you needed a way to specify that. And in Europe, they might apply not just to a country but to postal codes of another country or to just a specific group of islands. All of the edge cases that gave our clients headaches and which we wanted to solve from day one this time. And we already have a, is it a Kong that's contributing tax information, or is that a Yeah, so our tax, our tax library became immediately popular, and aside from Cilius deciding they want to use it, we also had great success with SaaS solutions adopting us. So, for example, Foxycart, which is a, an American SaaS, decided to use our tax library to handle their uh, their tax, therefore solving the problems that Europe introduced with their new tax laws. And Kong, a British SAS, did the same. Because what we also did was not leave the selection of the tax types and, and uh, rates to rules. Instead, we have this system of resolvers, which are actually classes, that hold all of the logic specific to a, one market. So we ship with logic for the European Union, for Canada, and we are going to expand that over time. And those cl classes can account for whether you're selling B2B or B2C, whether you're selling physical or digital products or events, and all of the other variables that we know about that can be used to influence the selection of a text type and a rate inside one market. And this logic can then be uh, easily unit testable. Go. Do you, uh, do you rate? Yes. Yes, so we have the concept of compound taxes, which is important for Canada. You get taxed on your tax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and I know it's not only Canada. There are, there are examples in Europe as well. They don't need to be compound, but yes, you can apply more than one tax rate. There is no limitation to one, uh, and you can choose how they're calculated. So as I said, it brought us a lot of popularity, and... We are getting more and more contributors, which is great because it means that parts of commerce are being used in production today. Commerce 2.0 won't be released at, in beta form until October for sure, but today people are using our addressing and our tax code in production. So I get pull requests every day that say, your postal code validation is not precise enough in China for Taiwan and these few provinces. I said, sorry, and I merged that. <laughs> or. Foxycard contacts me and says, well, what about a U.S. company that registers to collect European VAT? And I'm like, that's weird. Sure, let's <laughs> fix that. <laughs> so we have already managed to uh, fix many of the edge cases that we never even cared about before, but now when we release on day one, we will have a truly battle-tested solution. And this is one of the benefits to creating the libraries, aside from the knowledge sharing and establishing the authority of Drupal Commerce and our experience in all of these other markets. And really, that's, that's the story. You know, Boyan has been leading a lot of that effort and attracting good con contributions from, you know, Drupal community members and building bridges with the Symphony team and Foxycart team and so on. So, uh, I'm I'm really excited uh, about everything that's happening in these libraries. And Boyan, I think you've done a fantastic job. Um, so we can give him a round of applause and then take questions. <laughs> And if you would please use the microphone um, so we can get them on the recording. Go ahead. Yeah, so could you guys speak to the U.S.? Can you get a little closer to you? Can you hear all right? Almost. Just rock it. Okay. Can you guys speak to the um, U.S. state sales tax problem, you know, the 9,000 yeah. different tax passengers? Yeah, so there's, yeah. A, there's a company downstairs called Avalara that has a tax yeah. management solution. So if That's I can, what you should do. If I can Go a little further. I mean, we've actually used Avalara. Okay. They're good. They're expensive. Yeah, it's an expensive um, problem. Yeah, yeah. 
Is, yeah. there any, is there any alternative? Yeah, so what I can say is that if you're selling from just one state and don't have nexus in other states, then you only have one potential tax rate and you can apply that. If you have nexus in other states, there are some states that say if you have nexus with us, you can still apply your own tax rate. In that case, you're also fine. If they use destination-based sales tax, which means that they always apply their own tax rates which vary by postal code, there's no way to solve that because you would need to collect the tax rates of every single municipality and city in every single uh, state where you have nexus. And in that yeah. case, there is just no way to do that inside commerce unless we want to do the data gathering ourselves, but the data would soon be outdated. So, uh, But it, it also depends on the state you're in. I mean, California, uh, Florida, Washington State, Colorado, y your tax rate varies, not even by zip code, even by like street address at times. You know, by by the municipality here, like, and so it's just impossible to manage all of that in house. Um, the simplest um, case would be like South Carolina, where I'm from. You have a six percent statewide sales tax. Okay, well, you still have to know about tax holidays. That you know, that there's a week in the year where you don't have to where you aren't supposed to get sales tax charged. Um, or you know, certain products for certain types of income brackets may not be taxed, whereas they would for other income. You know, it's like it's a complicated problem, and you know, ultimately, like I I, I would only trust somebody who dedicated their life to, to managing that, to manage it for me. Yeah, basically David Kitchen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's our resident tax expert who spent like a month teaching us how to do European taxes. But in any case, I like to say that the only good solution for these kind of problems is revolution. But we did manage to do yeah. a lot of it in code as well. <laughs> I just point out one more, one more problem in that domain is anybody who has an affiliate marketing program, and a lot of people do, is encountering Nexus problems. Yeah, all of your affiliates are Nexus. Yeah, define Nexus. That's why Amazon pulls their affiliate program out of states. And yeah, so. Well, as always, thanks for your great presentation today and your hard work um, on the Commerce Project. Um, my question goes back to um, earlier. You were talking about changes to the uh, product API and the structure around those. And I was wondering if you could pro provide a little bit more color on your change of direction with that architecture. You, you, you know, alluded to a smarter products and so forth, and if you could just describe that a little bit more and where that is and its uh, maturity in the cycle at this point. Yeah, so, so uh, initially, I mean, today we are still going with the old data model of products plus product variations created through inline entity form because this is the model that's always worked for us and it is well understood. And as Ryan described, we have this great idea for a hierarchical product model which would allow us more granularity, being able to choose which data to share and which data not to share and to make unique and we are still exploring the complete UX and the questions there and we're looking forward to actually having uh, more to share about that at the end of this summer at least with a blog post in July or something but we still need to have many discussions about that if you're interested in that we will be sprinting on commerce on a Friday so we can at least talk about the problem space I can show you our mock-ups and our, our full plan yeah and and the uh, uh you know, the, the problem whenever we were developing commerce on Drupal 7 was that nodes were still kind of like a requirement for displaying stuff on the front end. Comments are, you know, tied to nodes. So if we wanted to support comments on products which people use for reviews, well, then we, we had to have a node involved somehow. That just wasn't abstract enough. But now with Drupal 8, we feel that the abstraction is sufficient, um, that we don't have to require everyone to go out and create this, this relationship between nodes and products to, to do the display. Um, so that, that's where like some of the, oh, we can do something different now came from. Yeah. Cool. First of all, thanks. Uh, appreciate you guys' leadership in this area in Drupal. Um, I must have missed it because I'm working on a commerce site right now, but I'd love a, a progress report on the 1x to 2x migration module that you guys are working on. Yeah, so <laughs> Drupal 8 has decided that they will not support any, any kind of a manually scripted migration. Instead, they are using the migrate module, which basically allows you to define the source of the data and then how that data is mapped in the new system and then it does that transformation. This is the approach that we actually championed for a long time for Commerce Wandotex as well. If you've used Commerce Migrate or Commerce Migrate Ubercart to move data from Ubercart, that's the same approach that Core decided to use for Drupal 8. So, uh, 
we are going to continue doing that. Once Drupal 8 is released, people will be able to write migration classes that move data from Drupal 7 and import it in Drupal 8. Whether that will be us doing the initial work or someone else who has a pressing client project remains to be seen. The good news is that Commerce 1.x has a well-defined data model compared to Ubercart, which was like anything goes, which means that the actual migration classes should be much easier to write than the ones we had to do for Commerce Migration. Migrate to Burkhardt, for example. I'm very, very excited about Migrate being in core. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, that's Drupal, that's... Uh, you need to get really close to it. Yeah. Uh, Drupal Commerce support uh, SAP or uh, Oracle integration? I'm sorry, I did not hear anything. The, does Drupal Commerce support uh, Oracle, or Oracle integration or SAP? SAP integration, something like that. Like did Magento support. Oracle and SAP integration. Yeah, did, did we ever do SAP integrations? Yeah, we almost did once, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I don't know where that one went. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> pretty much all of those integrations are one-off integrations, something that's done for a specific client site. I don't know of any solution that anyone shared with the wider community because what you're basically doing is uh, using the commerce extension points, taking the data at those points, and then sending that to the external system or doing the reverse. So th th there, there's maybe there's not much to be shared, but as yeah. I said, I haven't actually seen that code. It's usually ties to client sites. And, and one issue that you'll have with those is because those tools are so customizable. I mean, there's not like a standard implementation that we could even really like benchmark against. Um, but we, we do favor the idea of your Drupal site as a conduit of data, you know, taking transaction data in as a point of sale system might and then putting it back into Oracle or SAP or Market Live, whatever it is that you're using. Um, but a lot of that would just be like standard Drupal integration stuff, not like a, a, mo a canned module, I think. Basically, our clients are using Magento for commerce application. Yeah. How can I force them to use Drupal commerce? Well, th that's a hard sell to make because the strength of Magento is that you have a million pre-built features that you can use, but then if you decide that you want to do something your way or do any kind of extensibility, you have a problem. Commerce is the reverse. You can do anything, but the, the, <laughs> the amount of pre-built features is much smaller, mostly due to the fact that we never had 15 or more full-time developers like Magento had. Yeah. Yeah, we'd be happy to talk about it afterwards if you're interested. Yeah, yeah. So, so for any longer questions or anything that you think of later, we have a booth in the exhibition area so you can find us anytime and, and just chat. But we, I mean, we lose to Magento and we win against Magento, so it really, really depends on the, the situation. Yeah, we had the luck of having Ryan, which codes like five <laughs> normal <laughs> developers, so that was at least something, and we would buy him coffee so that he's worth <laughs> seven, but it's still not 15. <laughs> It's not 15, sorry. You'll need to practice some more, Ryan. <laughs> One more question. Oh, that's nice guy who's definitely not a commerce guy. No. Oh, I, I, I am a commerce guy. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> we've talked about having things other than products being purchased. For example, maybe Giannis having a file being purchased for a stock photography site or something like that. I, I, is it possible that all entities could be purchasable, or are we going to focus in on products? So, do you want to take this or? Well, I think it's a bad idea, but I'm not. You know. Well, the court is divided. <laughs> what, what, what we're certainly doing is uh, allowing you to have different product architectures and actually having the ability to create an order and line items without having a product entity. So that means you can implement your own entity types, uh, but whether you should be using an existing entity type remains to be seen. I, I'm thinking that it will be possible, but still a bad idea. All right, let's wrap up. Um, we do have regular office hours in IRC, if you like that. Um, where Boyan is typically there answering questions and coordinating uh, contributors and developers. Um, also, development is happening on GitHub and those various um, Commerce Guys repositories. So if you're on GitHub and want to contribute to any one of those, feel free. Um, and since we're here, we'll be sprinting on Friday. We're at the booth today and tomorrow. Um, so definitely would love to hear from you and incorporate you into Commerce 2.x development. So thank you very much.